is being recorded um, and uh, will be posted on YouTube at a later date. Uh, so the keynote panel today is the Manitoba government's COVID-19 response to view from the inside. And we've asked two people who've been very key players in the Manitoba government's COVID response to join us today. Uh, so Matthew Cutler is an assistant deputy minister with communication services, Manitoba and the lead on Manitoba's uh, government coordination team on COVID. And Cordella Friesen is an assistant deputy minister with Manitoba Conservation and Climate and a member of Manitoba's COVID-19 vaccination task force. So without any further ado, I will, uh, I will, well, I say I see the floor, but the format, the format of our event tonight is more of a fireside chat. Uh, so I'll be asking the panelists to, uh, to reflect on a few questions and giving them the opportunity. And there will absolutely be an opportunity for questions and answers towards the end. So if you have any, uh, you know, you can feel free to pop them in the chat at any time and, uh, and we will get to those towards the end. Um, so just bear with me for a second as I put the spotlight on Cordella and Matthew. It's quite the spotlight. Get to look at Matt front and center again. It's great. Gonna be you next, Cordella. There you go. Um, uh, so I will ask uh, people to. You're certainly welcome to keep your cameras on. In fact, we encourage it. So it's more personal if we can see what you look like. But please keep your microphones muted. Um, otherwise, I'll just mute you. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start with uh, with a question about uh, you know purpose and direction in in government and the pandemic seems to have provided a real clear sense of purpose in a way that government doesn't always experience and a sense that everyone is rowing in the same direction. Do you see that continuing? Maybe we'll start with you, Matthew. Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you tonight. Uh, not only just to talk about this, but also, you know, the cause of the opportunity to reflect a bit on the last year. Today's actually my two year anniversary in Manitoba's public service. Uh, I started two years ago today uh, and I can remember, you know, settling in in that boardroom with my deputy minister and my director team and having an idea about what the future of this role was going to be. Um, and then very, you know, within a year of that, everything changed in a pretty significant way. Uh, and, you know, I think the question is really profound. There's some folks on this call. It's a funny thing for Cordell and I to talk about pandemic response, because if I look at the faces, everybody here has their own story of, of their role in the pandemic. I think this fireside chat could be a, a really big one with the folks that are here. And, and a lot of the conversations I've had with folks with Joanne, with Cordella, with uh, Anna, with folks from the CSC is on this purpose item. I've only had one experience like this before in my career, and it was when I worked on Toronto's 2015 Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games, which were staged on the scale of an Olympic Games. It was a massive undertaking, and it really felt like the whole public service was headed in the same direction. What was particularly helpful about that is that it was timely. Uh, you couldn't stop. You couldn't look away. In our case, the Games was coming, whether we did it or not, and we had to deliver. Um, in the case of the pandemic, we are faced with the challenges of the pandemic every day, whether we take a nap or take a vacation or, or walk away. Uh, and there has been this feeling that we're all connected. Drawing on my experience with the games, there's also a real letdown that comes after this. Uh, that sense of purpose disappears. And even I think those of us who were involved in the government coordinating team felt this through the summer when the urgency of the pandemic waned a bit. Uh, after the first wave and in advance of the second wave. And, and it does take work, I think, to uh, continue that purpose, to identify that purpose, to frame it out and to own it. The good news is, is we get that opportunity for ourselves uh, in that it's not driven anymore by a pandemic or multi-sport games or something else. The bad news is we have to do it. Uh, and it's all the folks on this meeting, it's the folks that we work with every day who are gonna to have to figure out how to do that, what that purpose needs to be, and then own it and own it in a big way uh, because we won't have 
this massive thing pushing us downhill anymore. We're going to have to create those hills for ourselves. Uh, and, and I think whether or not it continues after this, from my perspective, is a uh, is an open question because it, it depends on our willingness to commit to that to that mandate. Cordella? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that honestly the pandemic has given government um, honestly is this alignment. We are all aligned on a similar cause, just have very different ways on different, different clients, different interactions and that sort of thing, but we're all aligned. We're all together. And so, and look how fast you can move when you're aligned, even if you have different programs, you're like fully committed to that cause or, or that response. So one of the things that I do question is, the importance of alignment for government, obviously for the future, um, because I think it's through that alignment, through that strategy and consistently driving towards alignment that you'll be able to get the momentum you need. But I can already see pockets going, well, that's done for me. I'm going to keep on now doing my little project here, you know, and so absolutely I feel it. I see it every day, especially being on the vaccine task force. Um, we know that the vaccine implementation is the number one priority for government. That's what gets us back um, to a healthier state as a province. But even then, someone might say, well, I have this other thing, though. So I that alignment um, and how to maintain maintain that, I think, is like the question for the future. Yeah, I'd add it. But, you know, I think it's interesting because we can talk about alignment and purpose. And I do think that many of us have felt that, right? We felt that we're working together. Uh, but it's a bit naive to think that the whole organization is in that situation. I think Cordell and I both have battle stories of departments of uh, senior leaders who just don't feel they're part of this. Um, and, and it does take structure, systems, and thinking uh, to get a whole organization aligned, even when you're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, the same was true, you know, I'll go back to the multi-sport game example. There were people who just you know, still needed to show up and deliver the services we had delivered before, who still needed to come to work and deliver the job that they had before. Um, and we, you know, I think in the rush of the pandemic still have work to do in making the entire public service feel like they're connected to the work that Cordella and the VITF is doing, uh, that GCT, that the Clerks COVID Coordinating Committee is doing. Um, and that, you know, we've we've tried to, to make that happen. We've done that through communications. We've done that through special opportunities and projects. But I'm, you know, there's still very much, um, there, there's still a lot of folks who are, who are outside of it and are still trying to deliver. And, and the alignment comment that Cordella makes, I think those of us who are public administration nerds start to think about how you, how do you deliver that, right? Is it through mandate letters and throne speeches and budgets? And if so, are those tools serving us right now? Do, does any of us on a day where a throne speech comes out or a mandate letter, mandate letters are issued feel like, okay, we're all facing in the same direction with the same purpose, doing the same work. Uh, and then, you know, irrespective of what the elected officials are saying our mandate is, when we look at the Public Service Act, when we look at talent planning and workforce action planning, do we feel on the public service side that we also have a, a purpose and a direction? If those concrete sort of foundational tools aren't, aren't, uh, pointing us in the same direction and, and giving us a purpose, then we need to think about what's missing in them. And it could be narrative, it could be communications, it could be anything, but but there's something missing, right? Because we do have those tools that can give us that shared purpose. The, the economic and social of the pandemic have changed a lot about what we used to think government could do um, and how quickly government could do things. The idea that, you know, federal government would be spending as much in a short period on the Canadian emergency response benefit really, you know, a year prior to COVID would have been unthinkable. And it changes our connections with citizens because previous people who may have previously not had a ton of connection or contact with either the federal or provincial governments suddenly are dependent on these benefits and their business is able to survive because they're getting a provincial bridge loan and these sorts of things. So how do we as government capitalize on that connection? So one of the things that uh, Matt and I have talked about is how government has never been more relevant in the lives of an everyday citizen than it is right now. 
Um, just because if you look at restrictions, if you look at how many people are watching Dr. Rusin or Dr. Reimer on a you know regular basis, the awareness of the orders, the engagement on Engage Manitoba on how do you feel about restrictions, um, just the media coverage on the vaccine rollout. We do technical briefings with the media on the vaccine rollout every Wednesday and give them an inside look and they're just not allowed to publish our names, right? So um, you look at that kind of engagement, um, government is so so relevant to the everyday life right now, um, where we might not have been a little bit more invisible or less relevant. And um, I think there is a good question about how do we maintain that relevancy um, for other programming beyond a pandemic? And how do we ensure that we're responsive to the needs of citizens, that we are evolving our services um, the way that we need to, um, to the expectations of uh, citizens? I, I think a great example of this early on in the pandemic um, um, Matt is responsible for a Manitoba government inquiry office, which is being bombarded with requests, um, right? So I don't understand this order. Does this mean I can't walk here, right? Just citizens asking questions. And he had, what, I think three people, four people that were regularly assigned to that unit and thousands of requests. And, and then there was a worry because of the pandemic when it hit of whole entire contact centers across government going down. So we have two people responding to requests over here for parks. We have three people responding to requests. Like we have a, a thousand phone numbers that any citizen could be calling at any given time and now no one's answering them and we're not even sure if they're gonna be coming back to the office. So there was a huge sense of urgency over we need to have a different response to tier one and tier two questions. Like we can't hold on to our material anymore. Like we actually are worried about this. And so in that moment, um, uh, and that project started April 1st, um, to really totally change Manitoba Government Inquiry's office ability to respond to whole of government programming and totally change that tier one, tier two response. And all of a sudden learn that you don't have to hold on to the material. You don't need a subject matter expert. You actually need a knowledge management system that has the FAQs and information in it so that you can respond to that citizen on that tier one, tier two, but you need to have a process, a confidence in the process um, for departments um, to be able to continue with that service. So it just shows you like we need to be able to evolve to the expectation of a citizen that they can call one number and find out that answer. And so I think a part of our maintaining our re relevancy is our willingness to start getting out of this is my program and therefore I'm going to hold on tight to it to what is the citizen expectation when they interact with government. They don't care about the name of your branch. They don't care about the name of your um, department necessarily. They just want that service. And so how do we change how we like even talk about our services? How do we talk about our interaction with them to maintain that re relevancy? And honestly, this whole idea of a 311 in government was, I think, broached in 2005, but people just didn't engage. They're like, yeah, no, that we're different. <laughs> we are program program's too complicated. And then all of a sudden we had this moment of being able to totally change that script. And only two or three departments have really leaned into it, but they have leaned into it. And we send out like a regular report um, as a part of that work. And so there's accountability, they can still see the themes. So as opposed to seeing every transaction, they're actually seeing the themes, you know, more of an outcomes based kind of this is what citizens are worried about. So I, I think relevancy matters, but it's also incumbent on us to be the rel like maintain the re relevancy that we've gained over the last year. I think, you know, Cordella makes an interesting point that extends not just to our relationship with our citizens, but to each other. Uh, because the next stage of the MGI uh, revolution through the, pan through the pandemic uh, was the creation of a central correspondence unit. Uh, those of us who work in Manitoba's public service are familiar with the number of folks, the number of offices that are responsible for replying to correspondence on a day-to-day -day basis inside departments, inside minister's offices, all of them replicating the same function, in some cases answering similar or the same questions, in many cases with very different answers. And because of the work that we did and that Cordell and the team in particular did around MGI through the pandemic, uh, it created a relevance internally uh, such that when we had this correspondence problem, it was a natural relationship to look to MGI to take on some of that work. So I think it's as much as government is back, I think also our responsibility to each other and our relationships has a newfound presence. When I, when I think about the public, I mean, I've, you know, I have responsibility for Engage MB. We've engaged more directly with Manitobans uh, than ever before. 
you know, that, that work of creating the Engage MB portal started before I arrived in Manitoba and Joanne, who's now at uh, Red River and, and is on the meeting with us and, and Rachel on her team uh, did some incredible work to get that system up and running and little did we know what we were about to walk into. Um, but I don't think that this is a triumph. I think it's a moment and we have to figure out how we capitalize upon that. Uh, you know, I think public services, particularly coming out of the Second World War and uh, in a period of time when social service in particular and a safety net was essential, really grew and developed. And there was a, I, you know, at some point, I think just a, uh, an acceptance that this was the way things worked. And we've seen, you know, through a certain period of politics and, and also just a separation between citizenship and government and this apathy in the way people work, uh, a separation between people and their government, but also a growing of government and its responsibilities to a level that's almost indiscernible to the average citizen. Um, there's an economist at U of T who talks about this being comparable to a, you know, a condo board, right? I, I live in a condominium. We pay a certain amount of money every month because I don't want to have to think about taking care of the elevator. And I want to make sure that the garbage gets taken away every week. And I want to make sure that there's a security system so that uh, I know that I'm not bumping into to random strangers in the hallway uh, when I leave the building. And, and there's a direct relationship between the services the condo board offers, the money I pay, and in fact, my partner is elected to the board of the condominium, and so we get to have a say in that work. Government is just a much larger version of that, but it's gotten so large that it's very difficult for the average person to see the connection between the taxes they pay and what happens at the health sciences center. Uh, or what happens every day in the education system, unless they're directly connected to that work. And so I think our challenge is going to be, how do we maintain that relevance? During the pandemic, it was obvious, right? Government was keeping us safe and it was protecting our health and protecting others. But when that goes away, how do we continue this conversation? And how do we continue to maintain that relevance? I think we do it through public engagement. I think we do it through communications. Uh, but I think that there are deeper, more systemic considerations around civics education, around how we share uh, the responsibility of citizenship. Uh, there's, there's some, uh, and I'll end with this, Emmett and Cordell and I talked about our ability to, to go at length about some of these questions, but- We can stay uh, for there's hours. Some, <laughs> there's some research from the Case Foundation that talked about the professionalization of citizenship. The very uh, reality of all of us here today is a byproduct of the the professionalization of citizenship. The work that we do as public servants is work that people did as citizens individually to help each other out on a much smaller scale. And it was the industrialization of citizenship that caused the need for social workers and bureaucrats and all of those other things. And so we are as much part of the problem as can be the solution, uh, but it requires us, much like Cordella said about sharing information inside the organization, it requires us to share our calling, our profession, our responsibility with citizens and be open to sharing what we know, what we do, how we make decisions and the process with them so that instead of it being this sort of uh, anonymous big organization that's easy to be upset about and want lower taxes and less staff and all of those other things, that it actually feels more like that condo board that you know and see and can be a part of. I'm, I'm just uh, mulling over the idea of government as a great big condo board. And I have to tell you as a political scientist, I'm, I'm somewhat scandalized, but you may, you may have a point. <laughs> that. Um, the, the sudden switch to video conferencing is the most obvious effect of the pandemic on the way employed, government employees work. And, and certainly just as IPAC Manitoba, you know, we had, I think, one event virtually before the pandemic and everything since has been virtual. So it's not just government. But are there other ways that you've seen government modernize? Because I think a lot of people would tell you, hey, not having to travel to a physical meeting that could have been a half hour through Teams is actually really beneficial. Are there other things that you've seen and what opportunities do you see going forward? Well, I feel like it's your stage. Well, no, it's funny because uh, I hated working from home. 
um, before the pandemic and dreaded it. I love, like I'm a social creature uh, for those that know me. Um, and now I love it. Like I love working from home and I never knew that I would become a person that um, loves to work from home. But I also know as a leader in the Manitoba government, I need to be visible. So it will be interesting when we start talking about visibility and the importance of visibility with staff because you don't have those natural walking down the hallway kind of conversations. But um, my favorite part of the pandemic pandemic has been teams um, that would never have been implemented uh, to the size that it could have been implemented without the pandemic. And we will have that long after this is done. Right. And our ability to share documents, work off the same documents. Um, so Matt and I are on a lot of common platforms together and there is no email. Like we don't have to email anymore. I love it. I can just call somebody and I don't even have to know phone numbers anymore. There's a little dot. That says, <laughs> just press me. Um, so I do, I'm excited about that, but I also know that we did a survey for um, engagement with staff and not everyone is doing great, right? Like, and so I think we have to really balance this idea that like there's this assumption that everyone has an office space, that we have, you know, these nuclear families that, you know, everyone ha can go. No, that's not true for a lot of people. And, uh, and there is, I know a lot of people struggling with loneliness, um, at least from my staff, you know, in conservation and climate who have identified, I need to come in, please don't, please let me come in. Um, or there's certain unsafe family um, dynamics that happens for the civil servants, just like it would happen to anyone in the public. So I think that we have to balance it. I think it's an important evolution. I still like the exchanging of documents. You can do that from your office or from home. Um, I like the accessibility though for rural and Northern. Um, I think that we are far more thoughtful now um, because of that. I think before we'd be like, yeah, there's teleference. Maybe we'll call you in. We forgot you were there. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen anymore. So I think that we have like really pushed the boundary, but I also want to be careful that on, on making key assumptions about our, our public servants based off of our own experience of it, right? So, um, but in terms of modernization, the one thing I was going to add to, I think that one of the things that this pandemic has allowed us to do as well is just to break down boundaries of you work there and you work there. Um, it is like the amount, almost all of conservation and climate staff when they got redeployed to other work um, are doing contact tracing. Um, and I can tell you that they were wildfire specialists before and now they're doing contact tracing. So I think that uh, one of the th the benefits has been people really getting exposure to things that they have never done before, being willing to jump in and thrive in that environment and see a different perspective and see different, like their different leadership skills. And one of the things that Matt let me do, in particular when it comes to the modernization of MGI or where it's at now, is that's Matt's program. And when I came, but he was busy on pandemic response, right? Like he was busy with Dr. Rusin and others talking about the orders, how to communicate to the public. He didn't have time to modernize MGI and deal with all the departments and all the rest of it. So I came in I, as a project manager from Conservation Climate saying, don't worry, we'll do that for you. And we pulled together team together and we did it in his program area. Now, just imagine your program area, someone else comes in, flips it upside down and then turns it around again and then leaves and you're like oh that's there now that would never happen under typical government right it would be like no i need to sign off on everything i need to you know like you would never want to let go of your control but you had to you had to and it shows that you can actually and uh and that's a credit to matt and his team because it's not just about matt letting off, go of control it's his whole entire mgi team that small little team of five and you have like a swat team of 30 coming in giving them a new phone system new standards of work new people new location like it was it was uh quite dramatic so i think it just shows that you can you can push the boundaries of ownership and across uh programs and departments yeah, I think, you know, the other piece of that, too, is that I'm not, I've never been a big believer in control, but I'm a big believer in governance. Um, and, you know, I've come from organizations that were heavily governed. I've worked in organizations that have less governance. Um, and, you know, I think Cordella and I worked through that process to figure out where were the lines, right? We, where, where did I need to be engaged? Where was I happy to just know that it was happening? Um, and that's different for every person. And that comes from a sort of a intentionality that's required. And so to go back to the question around, 
the transition and what's, you know, what's going to be different and what sticks. I mean, there's no question there's going to be service modernization. Things like Teams, we're already seeing the need for, like we had a mandate item for the revitalization of Manitoba.ca, but that became so plainly clear. Uh, you know, one of the first things that we did was centralize all COVID content at the heart of Manitoba.ca because the idea that Justice would have some stuff on their website and that health would have some on theirs and that we were going to have to make people navigate around and figure out where it was going to go just wasn't going to happen. Um, so yeah, service modernization will happen. Technological modernization will happen. It's helpful that we have the buy-in of central and senior folks. I mean, you talk about Teams, Cordella, that wouldn't have happened without TBS, right? TBS wanted Teams more than anyone else. And when the secretariat wants something, well, man, does it ever happen? So I think that the, you know, the opportunity there is great, but, but it's the culture and the governance side that I'm so interested in, right? That, those, those tools have enabled the senior leadership team to be together for at least half an hour every week. We're talking about a public service that for my first year here, I didn't meet the clerk and executive or the associate clerk for, for months. I didn't meet other deputy ministers and ADMs and, and executive directors for months. Um, and now we're beginning to know each other and work together almost immediately. New ADMs and EDs have been onboarded on an almost weekly basis, if you think about the whole organization. And they've just seamlessly been brought into the family and are part of it, where we had to spend, you know, when you and I both became ADMs around the same time, months trying to figure our way around the organization. And, and so I think that if we're intentional about, yes, the technology, but also the relationships, thinking about what it means to work remotely and, and in a... Uh, dispersed way, but also, what does it mean when we're back in the office, right? There, there was a plague, as there are in many organizations, of uh, presenteeism in a sense that because I can see my staff every day, I know what they're doing. And I think we all learned as managers very quickly that we we had staff we didn't know what they were actually doing, right? And and having them working away from the office actually created new relationships that we're going to have to navigate. So that. I don't know, the, the intentionality of the way that we do our work coming out of this is what's going to uh, dictate what sticks around. Uh, it'll be very easy to, to lose some of this if we're not meaningful about how we take the next steps. And if I was going to mention one of the other benefits, I know that we're, we're probably over time, is something on the vaccine task force that Matt and I uh, worked on back in January, which was there was a huge fear of the, the media, quite honestly, um, back a, a few months ago. But we were getting hammered in the media for the vaccine rollout. And we're like, it's not true. Like, I, we knew what our plan was. We had all the data and all the other things. And so pushing for those media briefings, those tech briefings, where we just explained the, everything Thing in detail, like this is how we know this, this is where we're at, this is where we're vulnerable, this is what we're working on, this is how we're doing it. And so every Wednesday, we do a tech briefing with the media. Now I do that briefing for workforce planning and I give them insights into where we're at, what's our retention strategy, what are our concerns, where are we recruiting and that sort of thing. They can't attribute it to me in the media, like so they can't say my name, but giving them that information actually gives them the ability to give that information to the public in a more thoughtful way, right? And that's that reassurance and you know, like that reaffirmation of what they've heard and, and us bringing them into the fold. That to me is a modernization of a government that traditionally just, you know, you, you email a question, we'll email you the answer back and it's usually quite trite. Um, and so it's a different interaction that we've actually built and proven that if you bring them in, you'll get better information to the public as a result. So I think that's um, a key relationship modernization that I've noticed and I hope continues. So you mentioned, uh... Cordella earlier that you've, you know, as, as great as Teams is, there are some issues with isolation and loneliness. And I mean, we've heard a lot of focus on mental health and, and we see it every week in the Manitoba government environment, the Connect Bulletin has uh, mental health resources and it, it's certainly the message has been there. Uh, at the same time, the pace of work has not necessarily slowed that much. And along with all of the COVID related work that, that various people are dealing with, there's still regular government work that's, that needs to proceed. Um, and I'm wondering how organizations and individuals can sort of can handle that, can adapt to that, whatever needs to happen to make sure that individuals are able to, to deal with it and that the organization is able to deal with it. 
You know, it's a good question because I've had to research burnout more this year than ever before. Um, it's, and one of the reasons is um, even because I'm, I'm the lead of the workforce planning and training. And that includes our workforce plan for the vaccine task force and looking for signs of burnout or where our risk might be organizationally if that person were to burn out or if that person did like, I actually have to be very aware of it in my particular role. And one of the things I have found fascinating about my mini bit of research is it's actually your overachievers that are the most likely to burn out. And when they burn out, it's not a slow, it's like literally the, the brick wall is hit and they walk away. Like it, it really is that significant um, where, where it's that, where that wall is. And there's a lot of more other research about burnout um, where it comes in as in flows and someone doesn't walk away because they don't have an option, but then you lose interest, you're less effective. And I've noticed this even on um, some of our team's calls and I've talked to some people you're way less effective in meetings. You do not get to decisions quickly because you're just, you almost repeat yourself over and over again, lack of focus, a, a whole bunch of other things. So I do think that burnout in key areas is a, is a concern and it will remain to be a concern um, through the pandemic. And I think that's because public servants is also dedicated. You know, like I've seen incredibly dedicated, like no one gets it done like government of Manitoba people. Like I, I have said that on the vaccine task force because I've worked with other organizations as a part of this and GOM people are just, they are committed to the cause, but that is at a price. Um, and so, and I've thought about this for myself and there is no easy answer here. I thought about this for Matt um, cause, and the way that I've phrased it is we're running hot. Like uh, it's, it's just constant and Joanne would have experience with that too. What is going to be interesting though, not just about like, how do we maintain our own mental health? So for example, tomorrow, my workforce team, uh, we've decided our, our eight o'clock huddles are now going to be walking huddles. So we're all moving to walking huddles, even just to leave. And, and one person will always stay behind, but it's going to be a rotation to take the notes and we'll send it out, but we're moving to walking huddles just to try and do something to disrupt that and check in with each other. Um, but I don't think that's going to solve the hours um, in the immediate turn. The only thing you can do is on in your team is like really look out for each other and try and notice the signs and get people to take breaks or find ways to get that, you know, four days off even, but that's not going to solve the systemic uh, issues that the pandemic has really pushed on the public service. I think it's going to take a long time for the public service to recover from this. And quite honestly, what I'm worried about is that um, they'll be like, okay, now we have to get our agenda done, you know, and everyone's just like, like, uh, we need a minute to recover from this. So I do wonder about that transition when it comes to agenda and cycles and all of like, like I do, it is a consideration I think about. Um, the other thing I was going to mention when it comes to um, burnout is um, I really do think that one of the things that we need to step away from um, in or take away from this experience overall is this assumption that we will just get over this, right? Like um, when, and I think that there is actually going to be a grieving period to the loss of this. And uh, my friend, Teresa Dukes, if you know her, she told me, Cordella, you're gonna have a hard time letting go of this. Like, even though you're tired and you're working all the time, when it also ends, you're gonna feel lost for a while. And you almost have to make space for that, but you also are not gonna just get over it and be like, oh, that two weeks off, that now we can move on. So yeah, I, I don't have a perfect answer. I just, I, I know where the trends are going. <laughs> Uh, more more or less and have similar concerns. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I would also tie it into a bunch of the other things that we talked about, right? I think that we, you know, I had this real experience of exhaustion and burnout uh, partway through the pandemic. And it was about when all of our formal, former organizational behaviors started to seep back into the way that we did things. So I was, you know, really eager and motivated and, and ready to show up to work every day when the system was moving and I felt like I could accomplish those goals, keep, keep everything uh, operating. And when it started to feel like the politics and the inertia and the ineffectiveness was coming back, that's when it got tired, tiring. That's when I started to think, oh my goodness, like what have I been facing? Um, and I do think that connecting to purpose, uh, thinking through intentional structures of governance and how we work together, all of those things actually make work easier to do. You can have high workload and you can have high pace, but 
it's it's all the friction around it that I think wears us down every day. So so some of those earlier conversations uh, are salient. I I you know I I'll I'll end on the one because I think Cordella talked about this all really well. But the one thing that she said about sort of it doesn't really end is really important. I've worked in organizations that have ramped up, and when you ramp up, and particularly when you're in organizations that are led by elected officials who have their very existence on their mind at all times, um, pace doesn't slow down on its own. You have to create the boundaries. You have to work with your team and your boss and your colleagues to figure out what those are. Um, anyone who's worked with or for me knows I have very high standards and that I lead high performance teams. But I do that, hopefully I try, also within, a, within boundaries that focus on health and wellness. And, and no one does that for you. Uh, bosses can be enabling, they can be supportive, organizations can be enabling and supportive, but when, when the pace picks up, it will not slow down on its own. Uh, and so we all need to care for ourselves and for each other to figure out how do we continue to be high performers and deliver uh, effective public service, but do it in a way that's sustainable. And, and it's going to work like, there's no, you can't wait for this to happen to you. You have to make it happen with each other and, and together. Well, thank you both for your very thoughtful answers. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for uh, questions. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you can just throw them into the chat. But uh, while people are thinking, I'm going to sneak in and, and ask my own question, which is that um, so the idea of going into a program and taking it over from someone because they're too busy and changing things and not holding on is uh, it's really interesting in where it works well. It it's, seems um, incredible, but I, I mean, just reflecting on my own experience, I think some people could point to instances of paralysis where if there's not someone clearly in charge, no one's making decisions. And I wonder if that's something you encountered as well and sort of how you get over that. So for me, um, there's a couple things in your in your comments and observations. I mean, one is that that taking over piece is fundamentally about knowing who gets to make the decisions and how, and knowing that you're aligned in the same way. So a lot of my comfort in that dynamic was because I knew that Cordell and I had the same goals in mind in terms of what would service look like, what what was important. You know, the longer term vision around a service Manitoba that actually provides whole of government service. So. So that's a always a fundamental piece at the front end of a project is, are we on the same page about mandate direction, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think oftentimes we think that we have really clear decision frameworks and authorities and hierarchies, certainly in public service. We think that's true. The pandemic scrambled those hierarchies. Uh, you'd be amazed for folks who haven't been in the Corks COVID committee, who's making, like who's contributing and what points in which conversations it's, uh, it's been necessarily a multidisciplinary exercise where everyone is engaged in the discussion. And what that means is that you need to think about everybody as a decision maker in that space. I mean, obviously there are the systems of the final decision, but but political acuity has been no like has been more important through this process for me than ever before, knowing who I need to bring along and in what way. And I feel like that's a skill that we talk a lot about, but we don't exercise a lot and we don't develop in each other. And particularly I've seen in the public service that many of us work in, and I know this is, there may be some folks from other uh, orders of government with us today, but in, in, our, in the public service that Cordell and I work in, uh, a lot of the political acuity has been lifted to the top of the organization. Part of that's the geography of deputy ministers being in the building with ministers. Part of that's about uh, ADMs and, and the role that they play. But I think one of the things that I've learned is the need to socialize and drive down into the organization as much politically acute as possible so that finding decisions, finding authority is easier for people. Because I, I do think it is a bit of an art that you need to develop over time. And the only way you can do it is by, by doing it. I think this is one of the strangest times for most public servants in government Manitoba because the higher ups, I'll just call them, and maybe is they're like, what do you need to make this happen? 
right? Like, what do you need? As opposed to show me some options, I'll think about it and get back to you. We don't have time for that. Um, and so, so that expectation on direct reports, and I've seen some questions about direct reports, is also working from a place of you, you can have any, if I can move a mountain, which mountain do you want me to move? Because we are going to do that today. And they're like, Mm, here's a pebble. And I'm like, no, I need the mountain. And so pushing, um, uh, you know, my direct reports in particular to think creatively, to think bigger, to think because we're just so used to being like only being able to move pe pebbles, I guess, um, if that makes sense, without m more approvals to move mountains um, and you being empowered to say yes and get the approvals needed um, in like a day. Um, not, you know, five weeks from now. And so it's been really fascinating watching people own their, um, especially because that scrambled hierarchy. Um, so someone that reports to me has as much authority as another ADM uh, currently. And uh, like, just because we have to move so fast and um, we have to trust her judgment in order to be able to roll out vaccines. That's just the result of um, where we're at in, in, in this uh, structure. And she even said, I don't know when I'm going to, I don't know if I can let go of the authority later. <laughs> you know, like she's already prepping for it. Um, but I just think it's a good example of like, but that didn't happen overnight, like pushing direct reports to think creatively to really, and that scrambling of hierarchy, it's totally true. Who's sitting with the clerk is not all DMs. They are not DMs sitting with the clerk. It is a variety of staff depending on their expertise or where they've been asked to take a leadership role. And it's very different from um, what has occurred in the past, but it's kind of forced all of us as public servants to really step up and be willing to be that creative um, and, and push the boundaries. But what made it work between me and Matt too, is we all also know where the authority was, was ultimately Matt signing off on budgets. He's signing off on staffing. When we wanted to move the location, he signed off on those things, but I had a direct connection to him, right? So he list, he heard me um, and I would say, here are your options. Here's what I'm recommending. But he always had to make the call for his program area, but he never held us up. And the one time he did hold me up, I said, we're at risk because of these reasons. We won't meet this timeline if you don't say yes to this. And so he's like, oh, okay, sorry, signed off. So it's also about identifying risk. You don't just ask once, you got to identify the risk if, if that continues. And I find often public servants will tell you something once and then they think you remembered it. And so I think it's about also being persistent. Thanks for that. Um, your comments about mental health really resonating with people. Uh, one person asked, how do you influence your direct reports to watch out for their teams? Well, I, you know, I think it's, so I'm, you know, I mean, you talked about being a political scientist and employer. I, I tend to think of myself more in the domain of uh, sociology and psychology. I think the, I'm interested in how people interact and, and what they do and, and how they um, shape organizations. I, uh, I don't have a clear answer to that. I have four directors who report to me in addition to broader teams and folks that I'm working with through the pandemic. And each of them need different forms of influence. They all perform differently. They all work in different ways. Uh, I did see in the chat, you know, some comment about uh, us acting and leading in that way as well. I'm really, in some ways, annoyingly transparent about the, the way that I manage my my work life. Uh, I had a bit of a window in my morning a couple of days ago, and I did a spin class instead of sitting at my desk. Um, and then, you know, there was an afternoon last week where I left at 3:30 and went to Thermea. Um, and I was really clear with my staff that those were things I was doing uh, because that's what I needed. But also I know I have staff who for them, that would not be the approach um, that they would take. So, you know, it, it, it might be a byproduct of me being an elder millennial and just sort of the way that I approach this work is that I, I think it's all in relationships. I think it's all about, I, like, I don't see this, you know, this concept of um, separation between home and work and self and work just doesn't work for me um, and I need to get to understand what motivates my staff and I need to know how they spend their time and I invite them to do the same thing with their staff but um, it's it's always about conversations and intentionality and relationships and rituals I mean there's a whole other piece there Cordell and I both had moments in our life where we either were or wanted to be um, religious leaders and I know that we both take the idea of culture and ritual and language and behavior very seriously in our teams, because those are the things I think that influence uh, the way that 
that they take up that work within their own teams as well. Cordell? Yeah, no, it, it's a good comment about, um, so what Matt's referring to, and, and he's the only, he's the first person we joined Manitoba government that he noticed this in me. He was like, um, and, and that is, I am a trained to be a pastor. Um, that's my background um, before I went into the um, public administration and then the public service. And one of the things that it strikes me about this is that um, when we talk about mental health and when we talk about supports for staff, and one of the things that's been reiterated to me is that we're all responsible for our own mental health in the end, right? We are all, we can make space, we can access supports, we can do all of those things and those will be available to us and we can talk about it. But ultimately, you know, I need to set the boundaries or set up, you know, the help sign or whatever that is um, that makes sense ultimately. And I, I feel like, um, but there's still ways that we as leaders can identify as this is important. So for example, um, for the 12 days before the holiday started, we did the 12 days of wellness. And every single day we did a divisional newsletter and it had something about taking care of ourselves and doing something as a group or individually. And then people would report back and, you know, just what's your favorite song that you want to dance to? And mine is like coconut. Um, people make fun of that, but I don't care. You guys can all know it when I need uh, a break. I, I put, on, put a lime in the co coconut. And, uh, but like those having fun in the workplace is a part of that um, fun. And sometimes I, I worry that when we talk about mental health, it's all like, it's all serious. And really some of it, it's like, how about let's just have the fun as opposed to talking about doing fun um, ultimately as well. And I think that we have to emulate that um, as leaders as well. Emmett, I'll just I'll follow up on that because I think I can cross off Anne's comment as well at the same time in this conversation around how we sort of prevent falling back. And, and so I'll go back to my comment about ritual and culture. I, I came from highly governed organizations where I used relationships to kind of scramble the matrix. Um, and then I came into an organization that was undergoverned and had lots of relationships and it completely blew my mind. I've, We're I've been only about stretching. relationships. <laughs> yeah, I've been, it's a Manitoba thing and I love it. Um, friendly Manitoba plays out every day. And, and so, you know, I've had to work different muscles in this public service than I've had to before. Um, and so part of it is always structural and it's formal and it's about policies and strategies, but I'm most moved by, and I think that for folks on this, uh, in this meeting, the impact we can make with small things in terms of shaping culture and shaping behavior. Uh, you know, Emmett mentioned Connect. Connect came out of nowhere. We knew that people were going home to work from home. We knew we needed to message, uh, deliver messages to them. Stephanie and Joanne and myself and others said, okay, let's, let's make it happen. It, it didn't happen out of nowhere. We had just finished an internal communications review. So we, ha like, we had structure that led us to that, but we also just did it. Um, the SLT meetings that happen every Thursday now between executive directors and ADMs, we just did. Um, and, and those are creating culture. Uh, we added sections to connect. We, so this newsletter for folks who might not be in Manitoba's public service, this weekly newsletter that was created during the pandemic now has a section that says, who's arriving and departing government and getting promotions and changes. It seems like a minor thing, but what it's saying to staff from my perspective is, we care about where you are and where you're going and what's happening. And we, we know that you need to know who your colleagues are and what they're doing to do your job well. And these are cultural markers. These are rituals that whether we know it or not, change the way we relate to each other and the way that we do work. And, and some so, of the, can I enter yeah. on that name? So one of the things Matt did was if you have someone that's starting new, we won't put their name in until they actually get to see it themselves. Right. Like we want someone to join the public service and at the next connect, see that their name is in the newsletter and feel a part of something. So that's a part of that building culture. You don't do it the day before they arrived. You wait till they arrive. But that's how you have to care about those details so that people feel like they're included and they see their name. And so, so we're doing the same thing now, too, on SLT meetings on Thursdays. If a new ADM or ED joins, we're welcoming them and celebrating them. Right. So there are little things that we can all do in our teams, in our divisions, in our branches, in our departments that actually build culture. And, and I would look for those things, right? We, in, in my religious tradition, uh, there's a, a tradition of crossing oneself or genuflecting when you pass an altar or a church. And, 
um, that has always had real meaning for me, not because of the, the reverence of what's happening there, but because when you do that, you're forced to pay attention to what's going around, what's, what's happening around you in the world. You're always looking out for what's physically near you and you're connecting to that space. So, so I think the questions around what are the rituals, what are the uh, actions, what are the things we can do that create culture is something that we all have a responsibility for and, and can do to prevent some of that backsliding that I think will be uh, inevitable coming out of this. Well, thank you both very much for your, your responses. And um, I think one of the things I really appreciate having spoken to you a couple of times and preparing for this and, and hearing your talk today is that you're both very open and candid about your experience. And it's not necessarily the typical thing that you see from government employees you're fairly guarded in their comments uh so i i really appreciate that and i'm, I'm sure the uh, the rest of the attendees do um so just a reminder that this has been recorded and will be posted on youtube and, and matt and uh, cordell I'll, I'll definitely let you know when that's posted um so we are going to take uh, uh about a five to ten minute break now and uh when we come back we will get into the exciting business of the IPAC AGM. Thanks, everybody.